Hello, welcome everybody to this session on birthing the holy, the wisdom of Mary and the sacred feminine. I'm Christine Walters paintner and I'm here in the west of Ireland recording this for you in advance of your session together because it's a little too late at night for me to join you live. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to use the gifts and wonders of video. Um, I want to invite us to begin, before I move into the content, I want to invite us to begin with a little bit of centering, and then I'm going to play a song, which is a litany of Mary. And the song uh, was created by my friend and colleague, Betsy Beckman. And in the video, you're going to see several images of Mary, and the song sings their names, and then Betsy will... Um, offer some gesture prayers to accompany them, very simple uh, gestures, if you feel so inspired. But you're always welcome to do the movements simply in your imagination. But before we get to that, I want to invite you to take a few nice deep breaths. And just to begin to draw your awareness, your attention from all of the places uh, your mind has been wandering <laughs> in the time before you joined this session. So you might imagine just drawing all of your awareness back, back, back to yourself. And then with your breath, seeing if you can drop out of your mind and the place of analyzing and planning and figuring things out. And drop down into your heart center, the place where the mystics tell us that the beloved dwells as a living flame of love, as a divine spark within every single one of us. And so as you breathe into that sanctuary of the heart, I invite you to rest there with the beloved for a moment. The Holy One doesn't ask us to do anything, but simply to rest in that space of being. And then from this heart-centered place, I invite you to enter into this video as a as part of our opening prayer, just to notice what stirs in your heart with these images and these movements. Thank you. 
And taking a moment to just let that song echo in the stillness of your heart. So you've invited me here to be with you because I've written a book called Birthing Holy about 31 of the names and titles of Mary. And these are different archetypes, different ways of understanding the sacred feminine. And there are many, many more than 31. I just picked that many because uh, it seemed like a, a lovely number if someone wanted to do a retreat for a month and focus on a different name each day. But before I talk more about archetypes and specific archetypes of Mary, I wanted to talk a bit about the wisdom of the sacred feminine. And so we all contain this uh, aspect, this dimension, I should say, within us, no matter what our gender is, no matter how we identify. So it's not just women who have the priority on the sacred feminine. Uh, we all have that aspect, that uh, ability to cultivate those qualities within us. And we live, of course, in a very masculine dominated culture. Uh, and because there's such an unhealthy um, imbalance, uh, that masculine has become quite toxic. And so bringing in the sacred feminine, cultivating these qualities, and Mary uh, is one of the doorways, I believe, into helping us to get in touch with the, the gifts of this way of seeing the world and being the world in the world. I think she can be a wisdom guide. So some of the aspects of the sacred feminine, one is the intuition of learning to lean into that um, more right-brained uh, side of ourselves. That's when I began us in this session, I invited you to move out of your mind of planning and analysis and getting things done and to move into the heart. And I consider the heart the seat of the intuition, the place of receiving and of knowing, embodied knowing, but knowing in a different way. Dream wisdom and synchronicities are very much part of this sacred feminine as well. So when we honor our intuition, we honor those um, moments in our lives when things come together and seem to have a deeper meaning, we honor the wisdom of our dreams, we listen to the natural world as, as a kin, as a, a family member, to know that we are of nature and embedded in nature. And we enter into this relationship with mutuality and intimacy, as opposed to kind of that more dominion and stewardship language we might have been taught, but to see ourselves as part of the wild earth and to embrace our instinctual nature, as opposed to always relying on our rational planning mind to figure things out that our instinctual nature is that original wild part of ourselves that longs for that connection with forests and the sea and the mountains, with creatures, with birds. Yeah, so that wildness we're invited into. And we can also do this by attuning to the seasons and cycles of nature. So in the, the masculine mindset or the dominant culture, time is very linear and we just keep progressing, always trying to produce more and more. But in this more sacred feminine way of being in the world, we attune to the natural rhythms of rising and falling, of fullness and emptiness. Our culture is very dominated by spring and summer energies. Um, but we need the autumn and winter to thrive just as much as that blossoming and fruitfulness time. We need the release and the rest and the incubation. And so the feminine is really about honoring that time in our lives and those moments of rest that we need, of letting go, 
right? That we're not always about building up and not always about creating new things. That sometimes we need to simply lie fallow. And then there's this other aspect of our relationship to our lives that I like to call the, the unfolding and ripening of our lives. So instead of uh, goal setting and trying to make things happen or even trying to force things to happen, you know, there's a time and a place for goal setting. But sometimes in our lives, often, I think in the spiritual life in particular, we're really invited to listen, to attend to what is actually unfolding. If we think about a blossom, you know, in the bud, that we would never force open those petals to see what the flower looked like. We let it ripen and unfold and emerge in its own time and its own season. And we're invited to do that with ourselves as well. The sacred feminine calls us to that rhythm. And then there's a posture of surrender and yielding and receptivity. It's a release of our cultural mindset of striving and reaching and controlling the process. So there's a, a softening, a surrendering of our own wills and desires of making some certain things happen. And then there's the underworld wisdom. Again, we live in a culture that's very much about ascent into the light, but the sacred feminine invites us to descend into the darkness. And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in a bit, but embracing the gifts of the shadow, feeling our grief at loss and injustice, allowing our feelings and our emotions to have room within us to flow as opposed to trying to control those and block those off and to discover the strength that exists in vulnerability and tenderness. The sacred feminine says you don't always have to be strong and holding everything together. And that often times what is most needed is a softening into the tenderness of our lives, the grief that we carry. And the feminine invites us to do all this in a very slow and spacious way. It's not about rushing or filling the calendar to overflowing, you know, going from meeting to meeting, being busy. The sacred feminine honors and recognizes that it is this slowness and spaciousness that gives us the space for creative possibilities to arise, for that holy birthing to emerge that we're all called to participate in, and that our innate value comes from being, from resting in the arms of the beloved and not simply doing. So I hope that gives you sort of an introduction to some of the ideas behind the, the gifts of the sacred feminine. I wanna talk a little bit about archetypes in general, and then we'll, we'll dive into some specific uh, of the archetypes uh, connected to Mary. But I wanna start before we, um, before we go into the archetypes in general, I wanted to share this, um, this quote from David Rico. He's a, a Jungian analyst who wrote a wonderful book called When Mary Becomes Cosmic, A Jungian and Mystical Path to the Divine Feminine. He writes, each title of Mary is a sound bite that launches us on a journey of prayer, devotion, and imagery towards spiritual awakening charitable action and mystical union, our destiny on earth as it is in heaven. A calling is a gripping incentive to invest our ego into the service of higher consciousness. So he's talking here about archetypes and the many archetypes of Mary that launch us into the deepening journey of the, the mystical path spiritual path, the contemplative path, however we might imagine that to be for ourselves. And so archetypes are really um, 
resonances or universal energies within each one of us that appear across time and culture and our um, ways there there each of us is a multitude right we aren't just one thing or one aspect of life sometimes we um we really start to over identify with a particular persona a lot of times it's our 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 work persona so we have a certain face that we show to the world but what archetypes do is they invite us to broaden our um, welcoming in of all these different uh, possible energies. And so the archetypes of Mary become a mirror for the potential that's within us. And this is really a poetic and mythic way of encountering Mary as opposed to a historical encounter. The history can be important and interesting, but I think for the journey of the soul, we're really seeking this poetic mythic um, encounter. And for example, the Annunciation story is not simply a, an event that happened in the past, but a living experience that is calling to each of us moment by moment. Each of us has our own Annunciations in our lives, some more grand than others but it's continuing to happen in the world. And so there are many different um, archetypes. Uh, I'm gonna share some of these titles with you here. So the book that I wrote, Birthing Holy, it follows a four part structure. And the very first part uh, is essentially tools and support for the journey. So what I do in this section is introduce these three names of Mary, Queen of the Holy Rosary, Queen of All Saints, and Queen of Angels. And what, uh, what I do here is invite you to consider, first of all, that Mary um, offers us the, the gift of the rosary, if that's something that you're drawn to pray with or have prayed with in the past. Uh, it's a very lovely embodied meditative way to pray. Um, and then Mary is also the queen of the saints and the angels, which means that she is um, sort of has this consort of um, these mystical lovers, right, beyond the veil that want to support us in our journey, want to give us their wisdom, to give us their love and their support. And so we can call on Mary to help us become more aware of these dimensions uh, of, of our lives, to know that that support is there for us. And then the first um, sort of stage of the three stages that I explore. It's not really like a three-step journey because it's not that linear, um, but we begin with hearing the call, which is our own personal annunciation. And I included a number of images uh, in this section, and we're going to be exploring the archetype of virgin here in a few moments a little bit more. Uh, and I'm going to hopefully broaden your understanding of what virgin might mean, because it certainly tends to be the dominant image of Mary that we're given. But there's a beautiful image of Mary as untire of knots, the one who uh, loosens the knots uh, that, um, yeah, that vex us <laughs> or the things that we're really struggling with. Mustafia is one of the Islamic names of Mary. So I really wanted to create a bridge uh, between Christianity and the Islamic tradition because Islam really reverences Mary a great deal and has several names for her. But Mustafia is the one where uh, it's she who is chosen. So it connects us back to the Annunciation. There's Mary as the gate of heaven, that portal into our calling, that doorway. Hodukatria is one of the um, orthodox names of Mary. So again, a, a dialogue with the orthodox tradition uh, and she who shows the way. So in these images of Mary, she is pointing to Jesus as the, 
um, as the one who uh, guides us in our call. Mm -hmm. Then we have Star of the Sea and Morning Star. Both of those images are um, guiding images. We can call on Mary, a star of the sea, to guide us in the right direction. And Seat of Wisdom and Mother of Good Counsel, we can ask Mary for her wise um, her wise uh, advice, her wise counsel, uh, for how we should respond to this initial call that we experience in our lives at various times. And then the middle part of this journey of birthing the holy is incubation and gestation, which is, um, again, connected to this season of winter in particular, which is part of the sacred feminine. So instead of perhaps more typical hero's journey where, uh, you know, you go out and do battle and have all these um, adventures, uh, in this more feminine journey of birthing the holy, there's this whole long period, nine months, of course, in a human uh, physical birth, but this uh, will vary and when it comes to our spiritual birthing. But the incubation and gestation is the time that we move inward, when we listen, when we tend, uh, yeah, when we allow <laughs> what's happening within us and we, we aren't trying to make something happen, we aren't trying to force it. So Vessel of Grace is a beautiful image of Mary as a holy container for our, um, for our prayers. Our Lady of Silence actually is an image that comes from uh, the Knock Church, Knock Shrine in Ireland. So Our Lady who invites us into the stillness of incubation and gestation. Mary of the Cell, she's an image from Austria. Uh, Mary who sits in the monk's cell and waits and attends and prays to the divine. Our Lady of the Underworld, who we're gonna explore a little bit more in a few moments. She's an image from the cathedral at Chartres. Uh, probably one of my favorite images of Mary, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that underworld invitation, which is often part of our call and journey. And there's Mary, Mother of Sorrows, who is there to hold us, because oftentimes in that incubation period, we are also making space for all that's moving in us, and oftentimes that it will be grief that arises, grief that has gone ungrieved. So many of us are carrying that. And then uh, these four lovely images that connect to the four elements. I like this connection of Mary to um, her earthiness and to the air and the fire and the water. So Mary, the air we breathe, which comes from a poem from Gerard Manley Hopkins. Mary as burning bush, which comes actually from the Orthodox tradition a uh, life-giving spring, also from the Orthodox tradition, and Mary is greenest branch, which comes from St. Hildegard of Bingen. So these are some of the images we can hold and that might support us in our incubation and gestation. And then finally, we come to this um, invitation to birthing and co-creation. So this um, birthing that Mary was called to through the Annunciation to bring, to bring the holy into the world, isn't just a one-time event, just like the Annunciation. That we are also called to birth in the world and to um, to create with the divine. And so some of the images here: when the woman clothed with the sun, which is from the Book of Revelation. Mary is not named, but she's often identified. Uh, with that aspect, Theotokos, which is an Orthodox name, which means Mary as God bearer or God birther. Mystical Rose, which we're going to talk about a little bit more in a moment as well. Mystical Rose, Mary as identified with that bud that opens up into the blossom. Madonna Protectress, who's that aspect of Mary who wraps her cloak of protection around us. And often when we're in that stage, particularly the early stage of birthing, 
we need to set some boundaries. We need to ask for some protection to keep that vulnerable creation growing strong. And the mirror, mirror of justice, so Mary who guides us uh, to help support our creation to become a work of justice in the world, to bring, to bring justice and good news into the world. Mary is queen of heaven, so inviting us uh, into our own sovereignty. Um, Mary is queen of peace, bringing peace into the world, the cause of our joy, um, bringing that joy and delight in the world and reinforcing that we are called to, to joy, that that is part of our birthright. And Mary as tree of life. So this um, great image of our rootedness and our branches that reach out into the world with whatever it is, the gift that we have been called to bring. So this quote here is from uh, theologian Elizabeth Johnson. And she writes, Mary's mothering has the potential to promote the ripeness of maturity that enhances the dignity of all women who nurture and serve the life of others, whether biologically or in other ways. And I would say the dignity of all people who nurture and serve the life of others. We are all meant to be mothers of God, for God is always needing to be born, which I think is a beautiful um, image. And it echoes a similar sentiment that Meister Eckhart wrote several hundred years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, uh, and uh, Angelus Silesius, another Franciscan, um, also uh, several hundred years ago had a similar image that God is continuing to be birthed in the world through us and through our longings and our connections and our following our call. So we're going to move through these three, the hearing, the call, the incubation and gestation and birthing the holy again, but from the lens of particular uh, archetypes. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a taste of these three archetypes in more detail. And so we're gonna start with Mary as Virgin, as I mentioned. And so these um, images that you see, the black and white ones are actually um, woodcuts that were done by an artist named Craig Yinkst, uh, who's been wonderful to work with. And he created uh, a different image for all 31 of the names that I chose to explore. So we're gonna begin with um, Mary as Virgin and, <clears throat> In this, um, yeah, in this uh, aspect of Mary, which is probably the one we're most familiar with, one of the things we don't often hear is that in from an archetypal perspective, the virgin archetype is whole and belongs to herself. And she's impregnated with divine love. She is who she is because that is who she is. And so if we think about Mary, God had to wait for her consent. It's God who waits upon Mary and she's given full agency to partner with the divine. So instead of the Virgin Mary being this sort of very um, passive, um, meek kind of image, there's actually a beautiful power to Mary uh, in this in this guise of virgin, that virgin is the birth giver, the producer of new life. She's open, receptive, and living from her, her own center. She isn't under the control or dictates of someone else, generally in, in society under you know, the ownership of a man, obviously, traditionally, that would have been the case. So it's not about physical intactness. It's about Mary given the call and having the choice to say yes or no to the divine. And that when we embrace the virgin within, we're empowered to choose or not choose the direction that our lives might take. A couple of other images here of the Annunciation and the Virgin Mary. 
that I find kind of intriguing. So the virginity is this attitude of being open to the divine mystery and to the voice of the spirit within us. So we learn from Mary as the Virgin to live from our own center, from our own roots, from our own independence. And the Jungian analyst Marianne Burke asks, how does the virgin birth happen in each of us as a psychic reality? It happens as we respond throughout life to what urges us to our fullest humanity. What is the Mary part within us? And Thomas Merton talks about the virgin part of us as the point vierge, which is the French for the virgin point. It's that place within us where God is born within and where we begin to discover who we are and how to live out of this deepest center. So to identify with this um, archetype, the Virgin, is to know ourselves as intrinsically worthy and to have that power to bring that call into being in the world. And so she relies us that ultimately we only rely on the divine for our own power and calling. And the Virgin is in alignment with her inner truth, and she doesn't require the approval of others. So that's the Virgin. And I want to talk a little bit about Our Lady of the Underworld. And as I mentioned, this is an image. She's a statue in the crypt underneath Chartres Cathedral. You enter through the, the north door of the cathedral, and there you can find um, this beautiful statue of Mary, who also happens to be a Black Madonna. And Black Madonnas are um, all over the world. Actually, I have a little, um, I have a couple of images here. Uh, these are some other Black Madonnas, one in Spain, one in Poland, and one in Switzerland. But then this is a map. The website is below there, but you can see where all these Black Madonnas can be found. They're clustered mainly around Europe, but you can find them all over the world. And it's kind of intriguing to wonder, you know, what, what are these Black Madonnas about? And there's lots of different um, speculations, I should say. But I think there's something about uh, honoring the darkness of life as a sacred place of initiation. So remember, we're now moving into this realm of incubation and gestation. And in her book, Mysteries of the Dark Moon, uh, Demetra George writes, we continuously experience these alternations of creation and destruction, growth and decay, birth and death, light and dark, conscious and unconscious, it's the very wisdom our breath offers to us as well when we're paying attention to its entire journey. Unfortunately, in our society, we've been taught to fear and resist the decreasing energies represented by the dark, by decay, death, and the unconscious. So I think the Black Madonna in general calls and invites us into this relationship with the darkness, the sacred, holy darkness that is this place of um, underworld descent, sometimes the dark night of the soul, but really the place where our um, attachments to things and ideas, particularly ideas around who God is, are stripped away, but in service of an expansion within us, in service of an, uh, enlarging our vision of who the divine is. These are just a couple more images inside Shart Cathedral. There's a beautiful labyrinth there. And then a, another quote from Marianne Woodman. Uh, she says, there must be a death to the ego self. There must be a transformation in which there is a letting go of all false values, of all things that the egotistical nature mistakenly clings to. Once her cycles are accepted, those who love her are free of the fear of death, 
free of their own vulnerability and free to live in her mystery. So there's this death to the ego self is what I was talking about in terms of stripping away and letting go of the um, various attachments we have to how life should be, to images of God, to even how we understand ourselves. Um, this is the, the place of that kind of refining, the refining fire. And then this is uh, an image. These are the images of the actual, um, it's, her name is Notre Dame Souterre, which means Our Lady Under the Earth or Our Lady of the Underworld in the crypt of, of Chart Cathedral. And so we might think about um, sort of ancient Greek mythology and Persephone, who uh, is first abducted into the underworld, but eventually she becomes queen of the underworld. And that's a pretty potent transformation. And I think it's a, a lot of times our first encounter with the underworld, we feel victim by life circumstances. And the journey of spiritual maturity is to find our power in that midst, to find the, um, the empowerment that this journey of darkness can bring to us. So she has the capacity to be with us in our unknowing, in our times of initiation into the deeper soul mysteries of the world, which always demand letting go of our old identities and when we pray to the Black Madonna in this um, dark aspect, her fierce aspect, we pray for the strength to endure our own underworld journeys and dark nights and not to avoid them, but to open our hearts, to be softened, to be broken open so that we can discover our own uh, sovereignty, our own power, our own wholeness in the face of disorientation and disintegration, which of course is the, the ongoing experience of our lives. And then the third um, part of this three-part sort of birthing process is of course the actual birthing the holy. And I um, wanted to focus briefly here on mystical rose uh, as our archetype. And there are of course, the rosary comes from this connection with Mary as Rose. And you may be familiar with the story of um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, who appears to Juan Diego in the 16th century, a Mexican peasant. And uh, I won't tell the whole story here, but um, he asks uh, for a sign from her and she says to go to the summit of the mountain and it's the middle of December and tells um, him to gather the flowers and he goes and he finds roses. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later on, he opens his cloak uh, in front of the archbishop and all of these roses fall out. So what is it about the rose <laughs> that we connect with Mary and perhaps our own inner, inner rose or inner blossoming? Um, uh, Cardinal John Henry Newman said, how did Mary become the Rosa Mystica, the choice, delicate, perfect flower of God's spiritual creation? It was by being born, nurtured, and sheltered in the mystical garden or paradise of God. I think that's a beautiful image. So here's another image of our, more traditional image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and then Our Lady of Lourdes, who has the roses there at her feet. And a couple of an orthodox icon and a more contemporary image of Mary as mystical rose. So this archetype is really uh, about evoking Mary's qualities of that unfolding and ripening that I mentioned earlier on as qualities of the sacred feminine, the slow revelation, which connects us mystically to the divine uh, it connects us deeply to the natural world to know ourselves as rooted in the fertile soil of the sacred. Uh, and Mary points to this archetypal rose that each of us uh, has within us. And so we can um, call on that, uh, call on her to help us 
to tend to that unfolding and that blooming. And the rose is often a symbol of wholeness. And you see these two um, rose windows. These are in um, Chart. Uh, and Jung, Carl Jung, um, said that these mandala images, mandala being Sanskrit for circle, these mandala images were always signs of wholeness and that often his clients would have dreams of these sacred circles and they were always pointing the way towards, towards greater wholeness. And so we might think of the, the rose as the symbol of the opening towards our own wholeness, which involves bringing to birth our gifts in the world. Um, and also a reminder again of not following that linear path of letting our lives be organic, um, invited into those spiral mysteries of blossoming, of um, embracing all of the dimensions of the, of the seasons. So that's been a lot of uh, teaching. I want to turn us to a little meditation that I'm going to lead you in here for a few minutes, where you're going to have a chance to um, ponder these, um, these three archetypes in particular for yourself. So I'm going to invite you to, again, deepen your breath. And soften your body. Notice how your body is. Remembering that honoring our body's wisdom is a significant part of this sacred feminine way. And again, letting your awareness drop from your mind into your heart, into this place of deepest center of the inner sanctuary. And again, <clears throat> connecting to the Holy One, the beloved within us, who calls us to simply be. And you might invite in Mary as virgin, meaning Mary as whole unto herself to be with you in this inner sanctuary space and ask her to reveal to you your own virgin point within the point of years that Thomas Merton talked about. Ask her to reveal to you that inner wholeness where the sacred shimmers and sparks. And as you sit here with Mary as Virgin, invite her to help reveal to you those places where you're not living into the fullness of who you are. What are the sacrifices you make for others? What are the voices that undermine you living your calling into, in the world? and listening for her wisdom in response. And then opening to the presence of perhaps an angel, angel meaning messenger. We know that Mary was visited by Gabriel, bringing her call to birth the holy. So in your own life, what form is this annunciation taking? What are you being asked to give your full consent to? And again, take a moment to listen, to notice what arises And again, the Virgin within each of us knows our own wholeness apart from our doing, knows our own wholeness that we are empowered to say yes or no, that it is our choice. 
And so you may not know what the specific call is, but you may have a sense through dreams, through intuitions, through body knowing. You may have a sense of your gift in the world. And perhaps this is a season when you're being invited into a new direction or to deepen into the direction you're already headed. So holding space for this call, whatever shape it's taking or however uh, formed or unformed it might be. But we bring this, this call, this invitation, this enunciation, we bring it into the interior of our heart. We continue to rest there to let it incubate and gestate and lie fallow. We let that slow unfolding process happen first deep within the dark spaces of our hearts, of the underworld, meaning the place that we descend to, to let go of all that we um, no longer need, and really to be invited into the stillness. And I'm going to invite you to ask Mary of the Underworld to join you now in this space to be a guide. And to help guide you into that fertile dark space of the body, of the imagination, of underneath the earth. And maybe to ponder for a moment those places in your lives where you are longing to release, to let go. What is something that you need to release to be able to fully embrace the call that you've been asked to say yes to? I'm going to invite you into a three-minute, just gentle movement, exploration, and practice as part of this meditation. You're very welcome to keep your eyes closed. You're welcome to do this in your imagination. But part of the sacred feminine is to really allow our bodies to also have room to move and be given voice. So this practice, I'm going to put on a, a piece of music, uh, which is called Be Still, based on the psalm. And what I'm going to invite you to do is, as, you, as the music starts, just notice that there is a shape your body wants to take. So this isn't something that you need to figure out. This is just a, a listening, a deep listening and response to your body's impulse. So as you listen, let your body come into a shape and then hold that shape for as long as you need. And then whenever you feel the impulse again, come into a different shape. And so this practice is called shape and stillness. So you're just gonna move from shape to shape, but allow time in between to simply rest in that place, that place of darkness and quiet until that next impulse arises. So I invite you to take another nice deep breath here. And as the music begins to just let your body come into a shape and let this be a prayer that your body is guiding. Be still and know that I am God Be still and know that I am Be still and know that I Be still and know that
be still and know. Be still and. Be still and know that I am love. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know that I. Be still and know that. Be still and know. Be still and. Be still. Be still and know that I am peace. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know that I. Be still and know that. Still and know. Be still and be still. letting yourself rest in a final gesture or pose and just noticing what you feel in your body and gently releasing and resting for another moment or two into the silence, the stillness. Asking Mary of the underworld to bless those moments of unknowing of uncertainty, of stripping away, of mystery, of fallowness, of incubation, of gestation. And then taking another couple of deep breaths. And then inviting in the presence of Mary as mystical rose. We're moving into the birthing of the holy. And so ask Mary as mystical rose to show you your own inner mystical rose, your own pathway to the fullness of blossoming. Ask Mary to reveal what is blooming inside of you. And notice for yourself 
where you are with this blossoming. And if it's still small and tentative, if you can rest there with that without trying to force it open, without trying to move too far, too fast, what would it mean for you to allow your own path forward to emerge organically? To tend to what's ripening rather than holding some artificial goal. We don't want to try to force open a rosebud to reveal the flower within before it's time. Instead of wanting the answers, honoring where you are in the journey, honoring that space of mystery. And some of the ways you can uh, honor the wisdom of rose, which is one of the healing herbs in herbal medicine. It's a healer of the heart. You can buy yourself some roses, or uh, if, you, if you garden to grow yourself some roses, you can drink rose tea. You could put a little rose oil into some um, carrier oil and use it as an anointing oil for your, your birthing into the world. Um, you can pray the rosary, keeping in mind that circle of wholeness that Mary calls you to. And so ask Mary's mystical rose to also help to heal the heart of anything that still might be in the way of moving into the fullness of your own blossoming. And then I'm gonna invite you to take a couple more nice deep breaths. And to very gently bring yourself back to the room that you're in. And so we're coming to the end of this hour, and I know you have some discussion uh, ahead. So here's some questions that you might reflect on if they're helpful. So what has been your own experience of Mary? In what ways do these archetypes shift your relationship with her if they do? Do they open up anything new for you? Which aspects of the sacred feminine that I describe do you find most alive within you? And which aspects need some cultivating, some tending? And then which archetypes do you most strongly identify with from the ones that I talked about or perhaps some other ones that you're aware of? And which ones do you feel the greatest resistance to? We can always learn as much from our resistance as we can from our resonances. So I encourage you to hold space for both of those. So I just want to close us out here with a, a blessing. Um, each of the 31 names of Mary in my book has a, a blessing that I wrote. So I'm gonna read you uh, the blessing from Mary, Mystical Rose. Blessed Mary, Mystical Rose, you unfold your petals, slowly revealing your mysteries one by one. The color of passion, the fragrance of bliss, soft like a warm embrace, reveal to us our own souls flowering. Abide with us as we wait on the buds to open a journey from holding everything close to our hearts to the fullness of opening and offering our gifts to the world. Rose is medicine for the heart, tender of traumas, healer of wounds, a place for grief to soften. Be our medicine, bring our hearts alive again, Steady us as we learn to breathe more deeply and to dance like petals blowing in the breeze, releasing the perfume of kindness out into the world. 
So my friends, it's been my pleasure to uh, guide you on this journey with Mary. I hope there's been something fruitful here for you. And I offer you many blessings on your conversation and your continued deepening uh, into this journey. And may your own birthing be rich and fruitful.